All right, we're going to go ahead and get started today. I want to thank you all for joining us for the West Palm Beach Journey of Our Water webinar with Grassy Waters Preserve. As you may or may not be, hopefully you can see, um, we have Grassy Waters Preserve. The team is out there in the water, in the preserve. So I'm excited to get to them to chat more about the journey of our water. But first I want to show a quick video it has really great drone and aerial footage of the preserve. So I'm going to show that really quickly. It's only about a minute long, and then we're gonna get right over to the team out there in Grassy Waters. Grassy Waters is a 15,000 wetland, 11,000 football fields. Our massive preserve is full of water and is the water source for all of West Palm Beach, South Palm Beach, and Palm Beach Island. That means that if you live or visit these areas, anytime that you wash your hands or drink from a water fountain, you're using water from the preserve. But there's not just water at Grassy Waters. The preserve is also home to a lot of animals. Just a few creatures that call the preserve home are otters, bobcats, alligators, and many birds like the snail kite, bald eagles, and herons. As you explore the preserve, you will see two different types of Everglades habitats. One you will see is the cypress swamp, which is a flooded forest. You'll be completely surrounded by tall cypress trees, ferns, and fresh, clear water. The other place you will explore will be a marsh. The marsh also has plenty of water, but it's like a flooded grassland. In the marsh, there are tall grasses and lily pads all around. Because these two habitats are full of so much water, they are the perfect place for some of the coolest plants and animals. All right, so I realized I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Elaine Christian. I'm a sustainability program coordinator with the City of West Palm Beach Office of Sustainability. And as I mentioned earlier, we have the Grassy Waters Preserve team out actually in the preserve right now. So I wanna go ahead and swing it over to them so that we can learn more about the journey of our water. And we will get to questions at the end. So if you do have any questions throughout our presentation today, please drop them in the chat box and we're going to ask Sam those questions right at the end. Sam? Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, hi Elaine, thanks so much for uh, opening up uh, the cloud for us and uh, letting us join everyone uh, virtually out here in a place uh, that many have called this sort of Amazon of North America. And for those of you who've never visited us before, we are actually part of the historic Florida Everglades. And this is a remnant Everglades ecosystem because much of the Florida Everglades has been lost over the last hundred years to development. And so where we started with millions of acres, of, you know, not more than 50 years ago, we're only left with about 2 million acres currently. And Grassy Waters occupies about 15,500 acres. That's about 24 square miles. So just to give you an idea of what that looks like, it's about the size uh, of Manhattan, a little smaller. But this occupies almost 45% of the entire city's land area. Why is that important? Well, because the water that you see out here is part of the city's drinking water supply. This is a fresh water supply. We are not connected to the ocean. so Tidal influence doesn't affect us here. Where does all this water come from? Rain. So we're actually a rain-fed system. More importantly, this is surface water. And the difference between surface water and groundwater, well, obviously, this is the water that you can see. The groundwater is water that is actually underneath us. And the Everglades and much of South Florida has a really unique geology. The basement rock of Florida is made out of limestone. And that limestone is basically formed from ancient coral shells that left their skeletal remains behind. And where we're standing right here, you're actually looking at a, an area that would have once been a part of an ancient sand dune. So going back 150,000 years ago, sea levels were much higher. And at that time, there would have actually been the Atlantic Ocean right here where grassy is, and there would have been a sand dune. So the waves are crashing over the coral reefs, depositing sand, 
And if you don't believe me, I'll go ahead and I'll reach down in here and show you that this sand is part of an ancient beach. There's even old fossilized shells that are remained in there. So even if you dig a hole in your backyard, chances are you're gonna hit sand. And the reason why, again, is because much of South Florida has been covered by ocean for much of its geological life. Well, as the climate shifted and we entered into a glacial period, what happens is the ocean begins to retreat further east and it leaves behind more and more sand dunes until you have the current coastline as we know of it today. What makes us kind of unique is, is that in between those ancient sand dunes formed what's called a slough. And grassy waters is part of what's called the Loxahatchee Slough. Loxahatchee is a seminal word meaning turtle. So you could think of it as Pearl Slough and Loxahatchee River is Turtle River. That slough is a narrow band of shallow water that actually moves and it's gravity fed. And so during certain periods of time when there was a lot of water in the preserve, that water actually could push north and connected to the Loxahatchee River. So grassy was once actually the headwaters to the Loxahatchee River. At other times in the year, water could flow south into the greater Everglades ecosystem. Obviously, with growth and development, a lot of that water flow has changed. And that pivotal moment came in the late 1800s when Henry Flagler uh, came into Florida and began building his railroad starting up in St. Augustine and eventually set up his home at White Hall uh, in Palm Beach and needed a water supply to sustain his new city of West Palm Beach. In doing so, uh, there are two lakes that you pass by very frequently off of I-95 called Clear Lake and Lake Mangonia. During Flagler's time, those were small little ponds, but that was enough to provide the water for the so few number of people that were living here. But he realized that he needed a larger water supply. That's where grassy came into play. And because gravity allowed the water to move south here in Grassy, they built a levee or a berm around the preserve. And then they built the M Canal, which runs west to east. And that canal feeds the water from Grassy to the downtown lakes. Typically, we don't like to touch the water here in Grassy, primarily because we like to live off of the water that we get when it rains. So the lakes downtown and the canals are usually enough to sustain and support the city. So Grassy is managed not just as a water supply, but it's also managed for the critical ecological aspects of it, including a lot of the endangered wildlife here and the incredible biodiversity of plants that are just essential to the uh, food chains and, uh, and food webs. For, uh, for all the animals. In fact, you can hear one of them off in the distance there. Those are uh, cicadas that are making all of that racket. One of the things um, that you to understand uh, about uh, our water here is, is that it is all fresh water. And again, we get all that water strictly from rain. And one of the things you'll notice in the water here, it's a little cloudy right now because I've stirred up the bottom, uh, but the water here often has a brownish or a tea colored uh, appearance to it. Um, that doesn't mean that the water is polluted or dirty. It is really uh, the result of the pine needles from cypress trees and slash pine releasing the tannins that are in the leaves. And that's what gives that water that sort of tea color. One of the other things um, that you'll see in the water here is, um, I showed you the sand, but there's also slowly decomposing vegetation here. And this is called peat, P-E-A-T. And this material decomposes very slowly in the water. And that's because the water here has a lower oxygen content than our ambient atmosphere. So it takes about a hundred years for vegetation that falls into the water and decomposes to form our soil here. So at the end of the day, uh, it is a critical part of the soil building process here to allow this vegetation fall, decompose, 
and help anchor all of these plants here that have adapted to life in the Everglades. Beyond that, when people ask us about what lives out here, there are over 100 species of birds, and we're getting into that time of year for uh, migratory bird season. And one of the most iconic birds that's out here is known as the snail kite. The snail kite, uh, probably best seen on my uh, uniform here, is a type of raptor. So it's kind of related to hawks. And they grew up in the Everglades. And this bird has unique adaptations that make it a perfect uh, species in this environment. And they have a very particular food source that they eat called an apple snail. And so this snail kite is what we refer to as a keystone species or an indicator species. So the health of a wetland is determined by the water quality, the species that are living in it, and all of the other animals that are benefiting in those food chains. So in clean, fresh water, the apple snail thrives, and where the apple snail thrives, the snail kite also thrives. There are only 1,000, 1,200 maybe snail kites here in South Florida. Those numbers oscillate every year, depending on water levels. But one of the things that grassy does, beyond just managing it as a water source, we're also managing it, again, for the habitat. And that makes us very unique as a utility, that we're not just considering the needs of people, we're considering the needs of the wildlife and the plants here as well. So we can take a much more holistic view uh, of it. We also do programs out here as well, so it's a great opportunity for people to get educated about it through our public programs uh, and uh, also our school programs, which just at this particular time we've suspended but obviously as uh, conditions on the ground uh, will dictate, we hope to be able to uh, bring our programs uh, back online. But a lot of our educational programs can be viewed uh, virtually through uh, our website and some of our great online content uh, that's out there as well. One of the things that uh, dominates uh, the questions out here often is, uh, do you have alligators out here? Do you have crocodiles out here? Just for clarity, alligators, yes. Crocodiles, no. Crocodiles are a saltwater species, so you won't find them in this part of the Florida Everglades. But alligators obviously love these wetlands, and so they're ever present here. And you should always assume wherever there's fresh water, there are going to be uh, alligators. Uh, there are a whole host of other uh, reptiles that share these waters uh, from turtles, um, different species of uh, uh, lizards on the land obviously dozens of species of fish and an infinite number of insects that we know of and then the number of insects that are out here that await discovery. Some of the things that uh, you'll see out here in the, uh, in the Everglades is one of our most dominant uh, uh, species here. And these are cypress trees. And it's uh, getting to be that time of year where these trees start uh, looking uh, a little uh, ragged. And one of the reasons why is because they're actually going to sleep for the winter. They lose their needles in the wintertime. Even though they're an evergreen, nature always has exceptions to the rule. So when you come out here and you see a tree without any leaves on it, chances are you're probably looking at a cypress tree. Not dead, it's just uh, obviously gone to rest for winter. And when spring arrives, uh, you'll see these, uh, uh, the needles uh, on the cypress tree uh, start coming back. In sharp contrast to the cypress trees, which love growing in the water, um, if we kind of spin around here a little bit, we can look off in the distance here, and those are pine trees. And those are true evergreens. They don't shed their needles at all and they tend to grow on a little higher elevation. So as we talked about the ancient sand dunes that uh, once uh, existed here, uh, in those areas where you see pine trees, there's a good chance you have some higher elevation. You won't find sand dunes inland Florida anymore because they've been eroded away by wind and water. But we know that they exist because we can look at the plant species and the soil types in those particular locations. Another one of the species that's common here in the Everglades, and it's common in many of our yards, Florida State Tree. And that is known as the cabbage palm. 
I know you've probably seen healthier versions of them. And uh, this particular uh, uh, cabbage palm is struggling a little bit because while they like to be in the water, they don't like to be in the water all year long. Nonetheless, they're still very well adapted. Uh, they're actually not a tree technically. They're more closely related to grasses uh, than they are anything else. Uh, but they have a wonderful history associated with them. Anybody that's ever built a cheeky hut on their property or seen a cheeky hut knows that the palm fronds uh, are actually harvested and used for that. And that's a tradition that dates back to the times uh, even before the Seminole Indians. And in many cultures around the world, whether they call them palapas or tiki huts in Polynesia, the style and technique of construction is very, very similar. You also notice the, uh, the outside of the tree or the bark looks very, very different. Um, you notice that it's wide and narrow and wide and narrow. And there are some theories that scientists have that uh, just like you can look at the uh, uh, annual rings of a tree to be able to count how old it is, scientists are actually thinking that they can look at these, uh, what they call this corkscrew effect, where it gets narrow and thick. Uh, to actually get a hydrological history to know when there was a drought, when there was a flood or abundant water. Um, so we're kind of still learning how to, you know, read the, read the leaves, so to speak. Last but not least in the background there is why the Everglades got its name River of Grass. And that is known as sawgrass. Very sharp edges very uh, dangerous to be walking through, very dangerous to handle, but an essential plant out here in the Everglades has, it's a major filter for helping uh, uh, absorb any types of nutrients or pollutants that might actually be in the water. So wetlands are like our kidneys and they can absorb a lot of ecological impacts from both man-made uh, and, uh, and natural forces that influence the water quality. So without uh, going much deeper into, uh, uh, into the Everglades uh, than where we are, uh, I wanted to open it up, Elaine, to any questions that some of the folks have out there. And hopefully we gave people enough of a taste so that they'll come out here for one of our programs uh, down the road. You no, know, I wish I was out there right now. It looks like fun. We do have a lot of questions um, from the audience, so I want to dive into those. Um, First, to start off, um, what about mosquitoes, Sam? Do you need to worry about mosquitoes out there? Uh, you know, anytime you have wetlands, any place where there's fresh water, you're going to have mosquitoes. Uh, they obviously tend to be uh, worse at night, uh, oftentimes, than they are during the day. And uh, there's a lot of research about uh, who are people who are more susceptible to being bitten by mosquitoes can be based on what you're wearing, the type of color of your clothing. Um, whether or not, uh, you know, people who, you know, who uh, drink beer, believe it or not, or, or eat, uh, you know, stinky cheese on a hamburger and then go walking in a wetland are actually more susceptible. We're not sure exactly why, uh, but safe practice always dictates that if you're going to be hiking in a place like this, you know, protect yourself, long pants, long sleeves, uh, wear bug repellent, or in some cases, you can always go, uh, you can always go native and go old school and just cover yourself up with a bunch of mud like that. And, uh, you know, if the mosquitoes can get past that, then, you know, they've earned their pound of flesh from you. But uh, we typically recommend that people uh, just, you know, be careful when you're out in places like this, if you're susceptible to uh, uh, mosquitoes and, and cover up and, and, and wear uh, protective, uh, uh, you know, DEET or some other product that yeah, will help you. As a naturally functioning ecosystem, um, we do have natural mosquito controls here in the wetland more so than say if you had a stagnant puddle of water in your backyard that you forgot to empty out during mosquito season. We've got a type of fish called a mosquito fish or a gambusia that eats mosquito larvae, um, keeping the mosquito population down. Um, dragonfly nymphs. So dragonflies are actually in an underwater form for the majority of their lives. They are eating mosquitoes. We have a super cool um, carnivorous plant called bladderwort that eats mosquito larvae. And then once the mosquitoes reach their flying form, 
because we have a healthy um, water system here, we do have lots of dragonflies um, preying on the flying mosquito form. So I find um, during the day, especially here, there are, are very, very few mosquitoes compared to um, an ecosystem that doesn't have those predators like, let's say my backyard. I'm more likely to get a mosquito bite in my backyard than I have um, when I'm here at work at Grassy Waters. Awesome. So another question is, what are the methods used to control aquatic weeds or other invasive plants in the preserve? Um, there are basically three methods that scientists use and we attempt to use all three of those. One of them is biological controls. And the University of Florida has been working on uh, several uh, types of insects to deal with things like with Ligodium, which is old world climbing fern or, uh, or air potato. So biological controls are one option. Uh, another option is mechanical harvesting. A good example of that is how we use volunteers out here who will come out here and collect uh, uh, hydrilla or Eurasian milfoil, or we'll actually, uh, uh, you know, pull uh, malaleuca or cut the heads off of barnyard grasses and collect that. Uh, so that's another option. And the third option uh, is uh, uh, is using uh, by licensed uh, spray techs with the watershed division uh, using approved uh, products for uh, treating those uh, invasive species. Uh, that are both in terrestrial areas and in aquatic areas. All three methods have to be employed. And you have to really think of uh, invasive species almost like a virus. It, you, you can't ignore it. If you do, the virus will always win. And when it comes to invasive species, if you don't address the problem, they will outcompete the native species and compromise an entire ecosystem. And if you don't address it, a place like the Everglades would would cease to exist. And in fact, just to give you an example, um, Sarah, if you could turn around and um, I can, uh, we're kind of walking over to uh, one of these uh, examples of what's called old world climbing fern. You might have this in your yard, okay? So this reproduces by spores, so it's airborne. You can't burn this because when you put this uh, under fire, a lot of times it'll release the spores and just makes it even worse. Um, so you can imagine trying to pull this out mechanically, very, very difficult to harvest this, but it is strangling out several of our native species here. So it's a problem. It exists not just here in Florida, but it is a global problem. And it's considered one of the top one, uh, I'm sorry, top 10 ecological threats. And as climate change continues to play a, a greater role, in uh, altering uh, climate, uh, many of these species are going to benefit from it. And if they're benefiting, that means our native species uh, are being put under greater pressure. Another question that we have is, what can each of us do to preserve and protect the water supply or grassy waters preserve? I mean, my first uh, thing is, you know, you have to visit a place. I mean, most of us uh, don't consider where our water comes from, but I think uh, coming out the grassy and, and seeing uh, what it is that uh, we're asking people to uh, uh, protect and be participants in, because we're just stewards for, for all of the folks who live in West Palm Beach. So understanding how our water system works is really critical to that. Some of the things that people can do is obviously it's just water conservation. Uh, and uh, we don't realize it, but you know, every time you flush your toilet, that's actually potable water. That is drinking water that's being used to flush your toilet. Now that's not to say you should stop flushing your toilets. You got to do that. But even the littlest of things of, you know, taking a 15 minute shower, um, letting the water run while we brush our teeth. Uh, I mean, those are all small little things that you can do uh, just by conserving water. Because when you conserve water locally, you're conserving water globally because water is a shared resource. Every the drop of water that you see here, this doesn't just come from Florida, all right? The, er, these drops of water here uh, are from all over the globe. And the water that you see here in the preserve, this is the same water that was here when the dinosaurs were here. So we can't make water. It's a finite supply. And the availability of fresh water is very, very limited because most of it is 
uh, currently locked up um, in, in ice. So the availability of fresh water uh, and the ability for us to conserve it and ensure that we protect it uh, by just being uh, more responsible um, is really uh, uh, essential for everyone to take a role in. And I do have some water conservation programs that I will touch on in just a few minutes from the Office of Sustainability, but I want to get to one last question, Sam. Um, with the rising ocean levels, should we be worried or concerned about our freshwater supply in grassy waters? I think that these are the questions that are unknowns. Um, what we do know, obviously, is that uh, the advantage of a surface water supply is that fresh water floats on top of salt water. Um, does that mean that we're, uh, we're protected? Um, no, obviously not, because, um, you know, depending on how quickly that salt water moves in and how it mixes with the fresh water, uh, it, it can very easily contaminate uh, wells, uh, backup water supplies. So, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not in a position to, uh, to tell anyone that uh, what the future holds for a place like grassy waters, but we have to recognize that uh, as global temperatures rise um, and fresh water begins to melt and enters into our oceans, the sea levels rise. And uh, the full consequences of that are known because they're, they're, they're in the rocks they're in the ice cores that scientists have, uh, um, you know, have discovered and, and researched. And the argument isn't anymore whether or not it's a man-made problem or whether nature has made the problem. The problem exists and all of us can take steps to uh, help to mitigate that. Right, and with the Office of Sustainability, we are focused on adaptation and mitigation in the city of West Palm Beach. So if you are interested in learning more about that, I do encourage you to reach out to us. I will be sending a follow-up email to everyone who has registered and everyone who has attended today with more information and ways that you can contact us. And I just want to share um, just a few closing slides here with you guys. Let's see, if it'll load, there we go. All right, coming up on October 21st, we have Imagine a Day Without Water. And this is a day, it's an, really an awareness day of thinking about what we would do without water. Um, you know, if we didn't turn on our, or if we turn on our faucet and we didn't have water coming out, or if we tried to flush our toilet and we didn't have water, um, or even water to drink. So this is an awareness day, um, and it's something that we are really excited to, to participate in again this year. So I do encourage you to look out for more details for that, um, we have a bingo that will be released where you can win prizes, water conservation prizes. So go to our Facebook page and our website. Um, we're WPB Green on Facebook or the website WPB.org slash our watershed. I think we're still working on the finishing details on the website, but it will be up soon. Um, also, I wanna mention our tree giveaway. So. Um, trees can also help with water conservation and they actually absorb a lot of water that would normally be lost down your storm drain. So if you're interested in a free tree, um, definitely visit our website wpb.org slash 10k trees. Our next giveaway is on November 7th and they are for City of West Palm Beach residents and businesses. We do have an online tree application and safe parking lot pickup for you. Sorry, I went too far. And we also have rain barrel giveaways too. So we give away free 55 gallon rain barrels to City of West Palm Beach water customers, one per household. And due to COVID, we have made this a safe program. Um, so we've transferred it to a virtual workshop. And again, we have the safe parking lot pickups for you. So please visit wpb.org slash safe water. This is another great water conservation resource. So it actually captures the rainwater that falls on your roof. And instead of it just washing out into the road, into the storm drain, you're actually capturing it so that you can use it in your garden. And our next giveaway is November 14th. And last but not least, um, next Friday, we have a program with Bush Wildlife Living with Florida Wildlife. So if you're interested in some of the wildlife that Sam has mentioned today that live out at the preserve, this will be a really great webinar for you to tune into. 
And then as next Friday, same time, same place, 12 p.m. You will need to register, but that'll be um, out on our webpage and our Facebook as well. And this is our webpage, wpb.org slash green. And again, we are WPB Green on Facebook. You can also find Grassy Waters Preserve on Facebook too. They have a lot of great information. As Ed's mentioned, they have a lot of really amazing educational resources and programs that they do. So I do encourage you to look at their website as well. And just want to give a big thank you for everyone who has joined us today. I know we're a little over the 1230 mark, but thank you all for hanging in there with us. And hopefully we will see you next Friday. Bye.